Everybody, welcome to Patriot to the Core podcast again. This is Thad Forrester. Thanks for tuning back in uh, to episode number four. Today, the guest is Phil Taylor from the American Fallen Soldiers Project. And if you haven't heard of this organization, look them up. Amer- it's it's uh, AmericanFallenSoldiers.com. Uh, Phil and his wife Lisa have built a an incredible organization. Uh, it's a nonprofit, and what he does is he paints portraits of the fallen. And he presents them to the families, and it's it usually comes. I guess it always comes with a, a some type of ceremony and event, and um, it's very well done. So I'm really excited to have him today. Phil and I met back in 2012 because he painted a portrait of my brother Mark, and he made his presentation at the University of Alabama. We did it in November at an event in conjunction with uh, the university's uh, veteran and military affairs office and they were all very cooperative and it was a, it was a really really special thing um, we have the portraits Phil gave my parents the big original one and then all of us siblings got reproductions and we could always get reproductions of them as a family as family members of a fallen so he's really a selfless American and uh, I think you're going to enjoy hearing from him he's this he, he's very sincere about it this is a passion of his, and so looking forward to, to speaking with you, Phil. Phil, thanks for being on. Let's get right into it. But I would like you just to tell us, I guess, start from the beginning as far as with the American Fallen Soldiers Project. Why it started that, why you started it, and where it's at today. Yeah, it's so different. I mean, if you go back nine years, uh, that's when we the inception started back then, but you know, I lost a friend, July 22nd, 2006, uh, Captain Blake Russell in Iraq. And, you know, I'd been painting since I was in fourth grade, right? So my mom, she could see I could draw and paint. And so I went to art classes and I studied under different people and I painted professionally for a long time. You know, and uh, for many high profile celebrities and that kind of work and backdrops for Vanilla Ice and, you know, Keith Urban. And so I have those accolades and stuff, but there was something that was lacking for me. So when I sat in the back of the church at Blake's funeral, um, you know, I saw the family. I could feel spiritually their mourning. I mean, I could feel their pain. And I knew at that moment there was a connection between using the gift that I have, which has been to admirably provide to my family, but to be able to use it not as self-expression or for in-service or commission, but use it in the format of service towards others. And so there was no formulation, right? So I never put together some concept or idea that it's going to become what was Texas Fallen Soldiers Project, American Fallen Soldiers Project, and to be able to travel across America like I do and present these paintings to families just like yours in public. It was never that. It was just one painting of my friend who I grew up with, and the response came. So when his dad, Ron, called and said, I feel like Blake's back in the house. So remember, it was an IED, so it was closed casket. So the families had, you know, as they do, that you're well aware of, you can't A, verify that he's in the box, B, you can't touch or make human contact, and then C, you can't really say goodbye. Or So I, in thought and prayer, realized that the paintings, the portraits can do something very unique. Now, they are very different depending upon who you are in the family structure and your emotional state. Um, And for some families, it is truly reconciliation and restoration. So the summary of that is since 2007, you know, I painted 200 and now 26 guys and girls. Um, And uh, after five or six being shipped by mail, I was blessed to be able to drive with CBS News to Claremont, Oklahoma, uh, and deliver Sergeant Emerson Brand, who was killed in March of 2007, um, to his mom, Debbie. And at that moment, that's when I realized, you know what, I think I need to see the family, touch them, kiss them, hug on them as much as, you know, they want to see the guy behind the brush. So that's when mail stopped and personal 
contact began um, after Emerson was, uh, you know, killed, and I, I did that. And so since then, I've delivered every painting in person at events, uh, just like your brothers at the University of Alabama. But uh, so that's kind of uh, where we are today. Uh, it's very different in that we have a footprint. We have a national gallery. Um, it's 6,000 square feet, and it is a memorial. It's a, all reproductions of the guys. Mark is actually in the center in the main uh, gallery on display with bios. There's a theater for people to come into. You can have personal tours. We had a, a school class of 30 seven children come in yesterday trying to hold my emotion but uh so we we bring in groups and we bring in americans to be able to see the faces and put a name to it and a story and uh, i have one of my three working studios is in that building now we had our grand opening um well an opening to the public a couple of weeks ago so that's a big step for us after nine years to finally have a building that is wholly and solely dedicated to those who serve, those who've sacrificed, and the families they're left behind. So we're very proud of that, humbly, um, and it is quite a place. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, mean, I, I hear and see your emotion, and I've actually witnessed it firsthand at Mark's ceremony and also at Adam Services ceremony and you, you said something that I hadn't thought about when you talked about Blake Russell and how uh, it was a closed casket and the family couldn't really see or touch and uh, looking back I mean I guess that was a blessing for us in a way because we could see Mark and touch him but you know it didn't look like him <clears throat> and that was that was hard because there was always that doubt of is that really him and, but anyway, the the paintings are powerful. There is a realness there, and of course, I the eyes are very poignant to me. I think in every one of your paintings, and I, I definitely in Marks, and you do a it's a fantastic job. I just wish some more people could be be able to attend one of your ceremonies, or at least watch the videos because there are some very effective videos on the on the online uh, that sure. I watched plenty of. Before you know, we met you. What kind of what kind of backlog do you have right now of of heroes to paint? Well, just to kind of catch you up, I just got back from Michigan where I delivered a, a corporal. He was 21 years old, Ross Smith. But uh, that was 4,000 people, a thousand guys on bikes, Patriot Guard riders, 3,000 people from the Michigan area. Um, so you know. We're in front of, and we're blessed to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, before I answer that, it's <clears throat> when I first started doing the presentations in front of people, they would ask me, why do you do this in front of, why are you exposing families of the fallen to this grief in front of other Americans? And I struggled at that time to come up with an answer. And then over time, it was revealed to me through the families and what I felt like was right. I mean, you know my heart. So do the families that I work for and the guys and girls, the girl I'm working on right now, that I paint, that I, I, I do it because it's A, the right thing, B, it's because they gave all, and C, they've left behind grief in a new state of normal that most families in America have no concept of. So in that void, I found purpose. And then, so if I can remind and I can bring people to an event. I don't care. And I can use every TV platform and every vehicle portal that I can to share their stories. Then it's a win-win. The guys get to be re introduced to the public. The families get to also see that they're not forgotten. And then see, people can see that you can take something of any talent. doesn't matter what you do and how you do it, but do it in the service of other people. So we all have that obligation, in my mind, to take whatever talents that we have, whether it's financial or artistic or doesn't really matter, and use it in service of other people. And I think Ali knew that very well. He said the rent that we owe is the service we give to other people while we're here. So that's an obligation that we, we all should take ownership 
of the backlog, as you know, I think we're around 7,000 from Iraq and Afghanistan, and I, I don't track that exact number anymore. It does, it's not beneficial or helpful to me to be able to know every guy, every girl, every day that's dying, <clears throat> you know, but, but uh, it's hundreds. There's multiple file cabinets in the building that are uh, filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of requests that are pending. Um, you know, some from, you know, the very beginning of what we started, um, you know, Nathan Chapman, the first guy killed, you know, I painted him, um, but, uh, so I can't paint them all, but so I, I try to let the Lord lead and let relationships and inspiration take me to the right guys and girls, just like your brother, and then somewhere in that empowerment and that recognition when I understand who I'm supposed to paint, God seems to, you know, empower that and give some kind of breath of his spiritual blessing on top of me to, to make it happen. And so in that way we're sustained by that type of behavior. So, you know, yeah, the families, there's a lot of them calling. Why, why is it taking so long? And, you know, it's, it's a tough, thing we're in to be able to say you know no at times right so Lisa bears that burden more than me but the 30 35 I do each year I try to make sure that everyone's done correctly and the love that we share is done fully and um, I don't think I've ever painted a guy or girl out of time or the set time um, and they've all seemed to work out you know in God's perfect mm -hmm. time well, I can only imagine. I know how much time you and I and Lisa spent communicating back and forth in preparation for Mark's portrait. It was a lot, a lot of communication, a lot of pictures, and that was just for one person. So I can only imagine the others you're having to juggle at the same time and stagger. And uh, I mean, it's it's a huge undertaking. I mean, how do you how do you do it? You view this as a you know it's a spiritual experience for you. I mean, how do you how do you hold up and, and keep going and and deal with the families and their emotions? Yeah, it's very different from when I first started. I mean, I would be uh, I would be lying if I didn't say that there is kind of come at some level of cost, you know. And uh, for me personally, and I don't mean financially, right? So we're talking about spiritually, emotionally. Uh, I think it's no different. So the guys that own and are willing to go down range and to fight for, take the lead and take the bullet for the guy next to him is there's a cost, right? So if you're going to be all in, if you're going to go all in, then go all in, right? So, uh, you know, I, and I wouldn't be the guy behind the brush if, if I didn't feel that way or I didn't connect that way. So, you know, sleep is not something I get a lot of anymore <laughs> over the years. So, um, and uh, so I, I paint when most people are sleeping, and um, you know, and I think differently than when I first started. You know, and uh, I've been humbled by the process, and I've been blessed by the guys. You know, uh, for me, being with the families of the fallen and the service members, veterans, and those who. Uh, are active. I just got back from Pinehurst where I was with the third group and some Delta operators. Of course, they won't tell you who they are, but <clears throat> the gig is, you know, when you, you're with people that are closest to you, you feel most comfortable. And so, you know, I crossed over that bridge and I'm comfortable to be around and want to be around those, the families and and the guys that I work for as well. So, um, you know, I don't know how to really answer that at this time. I just think that, uh, you know, it's a lifelong mission. That and, and, um, and until, you know, God takes my last breath, I'll, I'll be at the easel and I'll be on an airplane traveling to wherever I have to to make sure a guy or girl has, comes home as much, at least their presence in essence to their family. Has there been a particular time that stands out where maybe you were speechless, you know, at a at a presentation and 
or dealing with a family, and you just you just had, didn't have anything to say. That's pretty much every time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, strange when you're an artist because you look at, especially you know, I painted for identical twins, as you know, and I look at your face when I saw you, and I'm like, you know, I probably I don't remember. I grabbed your nose and probably your face, right? So. I'm a very touchy guy, so, you know, when I'm with the families, I can see the siblings and the dad, and I'm like, wow, he's got your eyes, and the mom, and I can grab that, and they don't care, right? So I can touch them, and, and I do. I squeeze those parts of their face because I've spent, you know, 70, 80 hours with their son, their brother, in a very intimate way, and they have some history of who I am and, and the heart behind it, so... Therefore, they give me a hall pass to be able to kind of get physical. But <laughs> I think that there is, a, you know, I think of your mom as well. I mean, they, your parents had no idea actually what was going to happen, right? So uh, there's the wow factor where you sit back and you wish that you could actually be in the audience to watch that happen from there, you know. But um, I think it's when the words are whispered in my, in my ear like, that's him. Or I hear that expression inside the family oikos, inside that circle. At the moment, I pull that, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, marine from the box, and boom, he or she hits that easel, and the family affirms. They can feel and see that's him, right? And then the reconciliation of that moment, the touching. Um, so. I think it would be an injustice for me to say that there's one that stands out, but I can tell you everyone is like the first one, right? So it's, I thought that you know I would become more conditioned, less emotional, and more detached as the years went by and the hundreds of portraits got delivered, but the fact is it says intimate, emotional for me now, if not more, than it ever was before. Wow. Well, what about the the venues? You know, you do them all over. You know, we went back and forth with where to do marks, and the university wasn't cooperating in the way that we kind of thought they would for one venue, but anyway, it worked out great how it did. What What's one of the most unique venues you've, you've done a portrait presentation? Uh, you know, I mean, I would have to say, you know, ships are always cool, right? So the Michael Murphy, when he was being christened, um, they drove that painting, you know, in the bulkhead. Uh, the USS Missouri, um, you know, I delivered Craig Vickers, EOD, uh, from August 6, 6 August uh, 2011, CH 47 thing, where we lost all those seals and, and five attached guys. I've done both Noel and Vickers, so you know, I delivered Vickers on board the Missouri in Pearl Harbor. Um, but on base, on ship, on a tarmac, inside the space where the guys operate, probably for me is always the most special. Seventh group, we were the in inaugural event that went to Eglin Air Force Base. It was the first time they had a public event there. Uh, they had no event there. They just moved in inside that space and said, we want to have you come and honor one of our operators. So we did that. That was cool. So I think it goes back to what I was sharing earlier. I mean, to be around the guys um, is always, to me, the most important. And I think you would probably bear witness to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it was last year that INSP Channel did a series on you. Um, <coughs> Can you tell us about that? Because I watched it, and I actually made contact with a family that stood out to me, That whose son, uh, I sent them a book, and th th they've written me back. So what was that show like, and how did that come about? You know, it's amazing. TV shows are a lot of work, brother. They are a <laughs> tremendous amount of work. You know, in the end, it looks like it's all just you know, cut, but you're, you're doing it repeatedly, right? So, I mean, as you know, most of the work I do is very spontaneous. It comes from the heart. The words I share, note-free, and the stories I tell from the stage and with the families um, and the history that I have is all from the heart. So when you're telling and all these people, the production and all the cameras, and you're going back and you're knocking on the same door five times to 
You know, it didn't go right. We didn't get the so that that was probably the most difficult part for me because it I felt like it had it kind of encumbered some of the natural affection that Lisa and I and our staff and everyone behind us uh, possess and want to share. So it was difficult. Um, you know, would I do another show? I, I would if, if I had to. Would I want to? No. The reason I would do it is not for us. I would do it because if you can give me a portal, if you can give me any platform, any program, any device to be able to share their stories, then I will go ahead and go there, and I'll do the work, it, as you have done so well now in the book and everything that you do, public speaking on behalf of Mark. And, so that's kind of our obligation, but uh, it's, you know, watching meat being ground and watching, you know, a board being cut and a house being built is kind of a arduous long process but the end product is is a beautiful thing and of course my friend Gary Sinise uh, was gracious enough to be the voice behind it but uh, it was uh, it was it was it was a beautiful experience in the end to watch them but it was tough to produce them I bet yeah that, that, I, I can see how we take away some of the the authenticity of it when you have to kind of redo some things and yeah. Well, it was a great series, and, I, and I'm sure it introduced thousands more to you, or if not millions, more to you and, and the work that you do for these families. Uh, well, and then you, you were on, uh, what show was that, uh, Pimp My Truck or something? And, <laughs> it's called Counting Cars, right? But it's oh, on yeah, the yeah, yeah. channel. Um, but that truck's actually, I'm in right now talking to you, by the way. I'm in my pretty much excuse me, the studio where I work the most, that's my home, right? So this used to be a garage, but we went through a massive uh, remodel here and ripped out everything and built it. And and uh, outside there is my truck that was, so the History Channel called and they said, you know, we love what you do and would you like to be on a show? Well, we're going to take your 2004 F-150 and we want to make it, you know, a something special for the guys who died for our country on the behalf of the project that you work for. And I'm like, uh, I'm in. <laughs> so that episode, you know, was, uh, it's probably been run that I don't even know 20 something times. I probably get recognized more and, um, are get more thumbs up and honks and all that kind of stuff in that truck driving down the road, meeting people across America. You're the guy from Counting Cars, right? So, <laughs> yeah, that's me. So I probably get more credit for being on that show than I do for what we did 10 episodes of my own show. But I am proud that truck means that you drive the speed limit, you do things right, you know, you don't take aggression out on people, and you try to always pull over and do the right thing at the right time. For a person in need, so it's kind of a badge of honor, if you will, driving that truck. So if you want to broadcast that you're part of something, and my plates are four fallen, right? So number four, fallen. So when you pull up, <clears throat> you know what's going on. And uh, so I try to represent the guys and girls and the families, just like yours, with the highest level of dignity and respect. And I hope that I have carried that torch well. And uh, so I'm proud of that truck. Yeah. Yeah, well, it looked it looked great. Uh, that was that was a. In fact, I remember the host. One thing that they kind of um, highlighted in one of, in that episode was how he was saying, "Wait a minute, you, you." I don't know if he used the word exploit, but you exploit these families. You know, which yeah. what you mentioned earlier. You know, and so you you explained to him, and and he he caught the vision, I believe. And yeah, that was Scott. It. That was Scott, and he did the same thing. So many people have done, and. You know what? I had to ask myself the same thing. I mean, why do we do the public venues? Why do we go out there and even have a camera looking back at us? And the answer is, is because it's a mirror effect, right? So if I can reflect any attention that may be given to me back to guys like Mark, I mean, anyone, the families that grieve, that's my duty. That's my pleasure. It's truly my honor. So the more cameras the more activity, the more people, 
it's not for us, right? So we don't, we're not supported by that. That's not, we have silent partners. We have groups, corporations, individuals you never see behind us, right? Those are the people that fund what we do. We don't solicit. We don't capitalize, nor do we make an ask at an event for now pass the till or whatever. So we never exploit that moment for benefit of our nonprofit and or use a soldier, sailor, airman, marine in any context to be able to uh, do that. And I think over time, people have got that. So I don't get those questions anymore. I, I None. So people get it. And in the get it moment, it's like we all are in this together to cry, to mourn, to feel the loss, feel the pain, and to say that we appreciate it and to not forget. So the only thing I ask of people that attend the events is if it affected you, then do something in their honor and do something in your life uh, towards other people. And so that's the only thing I ask of people that are attending and uh, the many folks and now hundreds, if not millions of people that I've been blessed to be able to communicate with. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very motivating, or if it, it should be to everyone, and I think to the vast majority it is. Uh, you mentioned sponsors. Have you ever had any problems with 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 sponsors get, you know, getting them, having enough, or having the backing that you need to make everything operate? Of course. I think any nonprofit that comes from you know, Lisa and I, you know, in the history of, of <clears throat> excuse me, the history of the American Fallen Soldiers Project goes back to us. The first two years was on us. So we were self-funded. You know, I painted out of what used to be a game room. We moved the pool table out, moved all the stuff out, and pretty much all the people that used to come over out. And <laughs> we made that a place where I can honor those who died for our country and, um, you know, behind that financially, it, <clears throat> you know, we sold that home uh, to be able to downsize and we got rid of, you know, whatever cars and jobs and things like that that were supporting us to be able to give back 100%. Um, so it took about three years. I think in the third year, which is a great number, as you know, um, God seemed to start providing compensation and regular relationships that were able to uh, bring forth support and to that end we've been fine ever since well you have a good relationship with american airlines and yep. and uh how do you arrange can you mind explaining the details of you know what's what's your policy when you travel with a hero with a painting and how do you arrange you know with the the airlines and the, the airports and all that to to get the the, the portion on on the airport on the airplane and off and all those logistics. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, the air travel is not as important in the presentation, but it's pretty much comparable to it. And what I mean by that simply is that, <clears throat> so there's an official letter that comes from American Airlines, what we call the sixth floor. That's the top guys um, that run American Airlines. There's a letter that comes from us. It describes who we're carrying, where he's from, when he died, how he died. And when his presentation or her presentation will be conducted, and the pilot gets that, the number one, you know, flight attendant gets that, they distribute that through everyone on board. So it's an official process. We're met by the management team at American Airlines at the curb um, every time. Uh, so every portrait is carried by hand. It's taken downstairs in its own compartment, separate from the luggage area, laid face up with their name up. Um, so it's never touched, you know, by or no, no box has ever been dented. And as you know, the box has their name, <clears throat> you know, in gold, which is symbolic. And whatever branch that they served and fought under is, is also gold. And on board during flight, the pilot will announce what's going on. You know, this is so, you know, there is a there's a really incredible moment it never ceases to amaze me when I'm on board myself. And the pilot says, you know, I want to make this special announcement. And they do every time. And, you know, usually applause breaks out and they try to say, you know, the artist is in whatever. 
six, whatever, you know, and, and that kind of thing, which is uncomfortable. But and then once we get there, usually we're the first people off. And they bring the box, and and there's a lot of veterans that come off the plane and said, you know, I know of you, I know of your work. I just want to say thank you. And and so the painting is taken by the the, the downrange uh, flight crew, whoever we meet, the management team out to the valet or whatever you know um, w whatever we're driving in and they they care for it all the way to the curb and so uh it's uh it's actually part of it and the question is actually really good because behind the scenes it's not just one guy doing the paintings it's a group of people that sponsor support me in the work i mean yeah unfortunately i get most of the credit but uh you know in the end I mean, no unit is is, in, is successful in the military without a collective in, a group of individuals, a lot of them that will never want to or would want to be named. So American Airlines is uh, a gift that comes from above for us. They're an absolute blessing. Yeah, well, that the box the portrait is in, is there's no mistaking it. I mean, it's, it's big. It stands out. It's, it's a beautiful design. And I, I, that was one of the, that's kind of how I think. I remember wondering that, and I sat down and talked with you at Mark's presentation <laughs> afterwards. Is how did you get through the airport? Yada yada. So I appreciate you explaining that. Sure. Uh, um, Got it, man. I, my last guest, Mike Dillman, was telling me about when Michael Monsoor's parents were notified of his death, and he's a Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, he said his dad had a stroke. And his dad has never recovered from that. Now, that's been several years now. I'm not sure what year he was killed. But that was earlier on in the war, I believe. Um, do you... This may sound crazy, but have you had any type of... Uh, the reaction from a family when the portrait was revealed were maybe, you know, a fainting? Or maybe someone had to just sit down? Or they're just maybe staring in, 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 a ga in some type of gaze for a long time? Any type of a powerful reaction like that? Oh man, <laughs> that's pretty easy. It's um, it's more often than not. I can think of um, Staff Sergeant Jimmy Mac Malone, right? So I got an email from his mom. His mom's name is Vicky Lewis. She emailed yesterday. This is uh, he was killed in '08, and uh, but uh, I delivered him in pretty much near your brother. I think so. I delivered your brother in '12, and but. Jimmy was, I think, in 2011 at this event at a winery in McKinney, Texas. And so Vicky had never left her house, right? So she she became a recluse. She would not leave after she lost Jimmy. And the other son was also downrange and serving. They brought him back, kind of a Saving Private Ryan situation, and brought him off the front. And, uh, but, uh, so, but... I was about to go on stage, and they're like, the mom is not here. We were, she was in the bathroom, balled up like a piece of yarn, in the corner, in the stall, in the women's restroom. So I, I just blew through the door, went in there, <laughs> picked her up, you know, got her together and told her, this is how it's going to go down, and you're going to get out there, and, you know, and you're going to represent your son. Uh, you've been in your house for couple years and this is his time all right so I picked her up carried her out there put a chair on the stage and sat her down so it was the first time I actually had to take a mom and place him carry him and put her out there well now she's the one if you look at brush of honor and you can go online through Vimeo or YouTube just simply Google brush of honor you can watch that video and you can hear that mom say that portrait saved my life that's her. So we still get the emails. Um, we remodeled her house, by the way. We did that with our own hands and our own dollars from our organization. It was something that we felt like the Lord put on our heart. You know, it was not right. It wasn't tight, and it was it wasn't fixed. So we, you know, took a break from painting and went in there and took care of her home. But um, you know. Uh, I think that's a that's a great story, but I think to encapsulate and try to be as clear on your question, um, 
I just think that it's impartial. I think that everyone amortized over the, the body of work and the impact that each experience has had. It's very hard to say that one thing because in memory, if you come in my studio, which the public can, right? So on display, you have all these gifts. I mean, I've got the beret combat controllers and, you know, I've got green berets. I just got a clip. I just did, you know, two guys from third group. The last clip he was firing from his magazine, you know, has his initials, Riley Stevens, on there in gold paint pen at the end of the night with the guys, right? So I delivered the paintings, da 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 da, and the guys just slammed down his magazine. That's from us to you, you know? So there are, there, you can walk through that space and that place, and you can look at all the gifts, all the affirmations, all the letters from the president, senators, congressmen, and it just goes on and on. And sometimes you just step back and go, wow, wow, man. So what I do is I try to refocus back on why, why do I do it? And aside from all that stuff, I, I focus on the one person and family that I'm working for at that time. And inside that window of total um, intensity and effort, you know, I find purpose. And whatever happens outside that, I move in that space directly. If I have to pick up a mom, I will. If I have to hold someone up or grab someone that's just literally putting their arms around a portrait, I will. And, you know, in that regard, uh, I, I find, you know, a tremendous blessing being the guy behind the brush. Well, and you can do that because, you know, as you have said earlier, your motives are pure and there's uh, there's no, you know, trying to draw attention to yourself. I mean, so you can do these kind of things and people accept it, I think, because the love that you, you have and you show. Um, there's an image on your website of a little boy. I'm guessing this is a little boy looking at his dad. I don't know for sure, but regardless, there are those situations. Uh, and it breaks my heart. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's awful bad enough losing a brother. I can't imagine a kid losing his dad or um, a, a parent losing a child. It's, I mean, that that I have I have kids, and that that's just an awful feeling that I just can't imagine. Do you do you see? Is there? A, can you describe a difference? Is there between the mourning or the reactions between a a child versus a sibling versus a parent? Oh, absolutely, it's very distinct. It's very clear. Some of it was kind of on a curve for me learning. I was I was shocked by. So, and I, I say this uh, very lovingly, but I say it comprehensively based upon what I've experienced with the families. Right. So, take it in context when I share this, but. So for the parents, it, it's most emotional. It's just by nature, and that's why I work for about 90% of all the paintings that I do are for parents. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do reproductions, as you know, for siblings and extended family and comrades. I mean, we have a, a shipping portion that we build inside the building that is solely there. We have frames and reproductions and we're always reproducing and filling orders from years and years and years ago so shipping and you know filling reproductions of the portraits that we do is actually a vital part of the nonprofit that we that we move in um, but uh, the answer is is that so for parents it's a win-win I think for them because you can't replace a son doesn't mean that you can replace a husband right and you can't really replace a father but the fact is, a woman can love again, and I'm, I'm speaking about a wife. She can, and usually within five years, most have, if young enough, have already found new love, and they've been able to find a new family and connect with and even reproduce and so forth. So um, in that regard, the wives are very conditioned, you know, they're very structured, which a lot of them are told, as you know, be strong. If something happens to me, be tough, be strong. So there's a, a shell. There's a, there's a tough shell, and I respect that and I honor that, and I understand where it comes from. So they are living in honor of their husband, 
and they do it with a more rigid manner. The parents don't, they don't have that command. They don't have that demand. They don't have that expectation. I mean, their hearts are broken. They're not going <laughs> to replace their son. They're not going to replace Mark. So for them, um, they're uh, more compatible with the heart that I have. The siblings also are so uniquely and distinctly different, you know, because each personality, as it is with your family, is so different emotionally, structurally, I mean, how you guys articulate your thoughts and experiences. So siblings can be, I mean, which I just got an email from Ross Smith, who was last week again in Michigan. You know, his brother was the first one that emailed back, and he's, you know, he's just like, this this is 10 years, right? So Smith was killed in 06. So uh, he said, this is life-changing for us, right? So that's a brother. So sometimes a brother will, you know, move in that place and say, this is my experience. In summer, you know, you have to let them be tough and no tears. So, yeah, I've seen it all. But, I mean, you know, in the end, my calling, I guess you would say, in my heart is pretty much for the parents and uh you know so that's that's where i am well yeah thanks for sharing that because i i thought about not asking that question because i thought it it might sound dumb but there was really some insight very interesting insight there so thanks for sharing yeah it's actually a great question by the way that's the first time and you know i've been asked a lot of questions (laughs) that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that so I really appreciate that because that's a, it's a very complicated thing. I had to go through myself to figure out why isn't the whole family reacting mm-hmm. the way that you would expect them to or you've seen or experienced. And that's when you can fully embrace the pain that each person is very different in their grief and how they carry it and the work that they have um, and the place where they're going with that grief. Yeah. So, and that's in respecting that, um, I think shows a lot of maturity on our part to learn that part. So we've actually learned that from families just like yours. Wow. Well, it looks like you have a new tat on your oh, arm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my friend Matt Leathers, he's a Navy SEAL. We've got the SEALs over here and Marine Corps, uh, U.S. Army, Air Force. Probably need to get the Coast Guard on there some point. But, <laughs> yeah, and that one's, that one's, you know, I am the vine, you're the branches. If any man abides in me, I'll abide in him. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when I paint, you know, I have the, the nails of Jesus Christ on my right hand. That way I'm reminded about where the gift comes from. And, and apart from him, we can truly do nothing. Yeah. Well, what about you, Phil? I mean, do you what do you do in your spare time? I know you don't have any, really, but do you ever take any time for yourself? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it depends how how honest I actually want to be, but <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I I don't. My psychiatrist, who I've recently hired, right? So, <laughs> but uh, trying to figure out how to. I used to play golf, um, and so she's trying to encourage me to find some things to to do but you know it's uh that to be honest i mean it's very difficult to uh to break away um and i love what i do so passionately and lovingly and the time i have with the guys and girls in my studio and the work i do on the road with the families and i don't know to me that's it's all you know encompassing and time away from that including my family which thank god all my three girls are grown um and i can see a couple of them out there right now in the pool but uh i i i've had a hard time trying to figure out what that hobby is and where to go next with that but i'm working on that that's my own personal (laughs) journey (laughs) well is lisa doing any any probing or prodding too i should say oh i would say that's pretty much going on 24 (laughs) 7 Well, what role does your what role does your family play in the American Fallen Soldiers Project? Well, they've all worked for me at some point, right? So Corey, my middle daughter, she still works for me there. Jordan just left; she worked for me for a long time. Um, Natalie, she's finally found her footing outside the project. So, you know, it's a family operation. Uh, but if you want to work for it and you want to connect and 
it's for I think for them, their their bandwidth is not as deep, and so I think it's difficult for them to be around that a lot. And uh, you know, even the TV shows, I don't think they watch too many of those. But uh, and I'm I understand. I had a hard time watching them myself. Uh, so I think we have a disconnect there in regards to how much they're willing to put their skin in the game, their hearts exposed to what we do. So when we're together, you know, for them, they're, they're talking about different things and, and going down different paths and, and things like that. And, you know, it's, uh, we're working on trying to figure all that out. It's kind of hard. <laughs> Did you ever serve in the military or want to serve in the military? I didn't. I did. I tried to enlist and go in, but I had multiple back surgeries, so they pretty much said, you're not good to go. Um, but my dad did. He was Air Force, and we just lost him a couple of weeks ago. But uh, uh, so that was, you know, I have, you know, all his decorations and things from the Korean War uh, on display in my studio where the public can see all that. Uh, but... I always had an affection towards and a passion about the military when I was a little boy. Um, and so did my dad, right? So I mean, he's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers that he bought, you know, which I have in my truck sitting outside uh, from his passing that he gifted to me. And I'm going to put a big display. It's all from World War One, but um, it's uh, so, but now I serve. So I serve in the best way that I can to the guys and girls who do serve. And in that regard, I'm kind of in the rear for them. Oh, yeah, you do. I mean, there's I know people thank you all the time. And uh, but but just know that coming from someone who has seen your work firsthand is the recipient of it. I've got your portrait in my home. My parents have the big one in their home with the light on it. Um, my siblings have them. I mean, it's words can't express our appreciation to you for what you've done for us and for what you do for so many Gold Star families and for so many fallen heroes. It's it's a there's no way to thank you enough for what you do. And, I mean, you're 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 like a robot. I mean, not 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 in the sense of I mean, you're very you're emotionally involved, but you just keep going. I mean, you you don't slow down, and uh, it's oh. it's it's pretty incredible. You know, I've been looking at. Uh, different things that about life and I've been watching ants I mean if you look at an ant and just a colony whether it's bees or whatever they're always busy and what they produce is something incredible I mean for the bees yeah it's honey the ants build a pile and protect the queen but they do all that you know and so inside that you know they take it one little tiny step at a time whether a bird's building a nest one piece of wood, one little piece of fabric. But that nest is incredible when they're done. So I like to look at life as that, is that you can't build the nest overnight. You can't just produce Mona Lisa in one shot. But but you can do something. You can produce something that, that God appreciates, that people are in the wow factor over. If you do it daily and you do it with a regiment, you do it with the structure, and you do it passionately, effectively, for a collective effort. So that's how things get built, and that's how the ant hill is formed. So our project is only scratch the surface. We have many years to come and more families to serve and more guys, guys and girls to honor. So I look forward to the years to come. Yeah, a little bit out of time. I mean, you got to be doing something. Time's passing yep. regardless. <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, you told me, leading up to Mark's presentation, you said, he looks wonderful finally. Mark's presence will be revealed soon. And that was powerful. And that that just built it up even more for me, and um, I wasn't disappointed. So thank you for the gift you've given us. And, 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 for, the, and for speaking to me today, I hope the, the audience... However big or small it is, you know, the great thing about a podcast is people can listen to it for any time, forever, you know, because it's always out there available. So I hope that they uh, get even half as much upliftment as I have from spending time with you today. And uh, you're a great American. 
Well, I appreciate, appreciate that. It would be whoever's possibly listening, and hopefully they will, but did a radio show this morning, and it was the same thing, right? So you can just listen, be on your desktop or what have you. But And they were asking not even near the depth of questions that you have. Uh, but uh, there's, if you can, I mean, I looked at Mark, I looked at his reproduction, right, in, in my building, and I just stared at him, and I saw that hitch, right? So he had that little mm -hmm. hitch on one side, that toughness that, you know, and it, I'm like, wonder why Lisa put him right there in the center. And I'm sitting there looking at the combat controller, the necklace, and the things they've given me, and the coins, and, you know, the beret, and all that. And I'm looking at Mark, I'm like, man, he looks really good. <laughs> that is one handsome man. So anyone listening, if you don't go to American Fallen Soldiers and look at Mark Forrester's portrait, it's an injustice right there. Because that, to me, and I look at many of the guys and girls and go, you know, I could have probably done this or that. I look at Mark and I'm like, you know what? <laughs> that one gets my stamp of approval. <laughs> well, I think... Thank you. Um, Thank you. He he is he's a good looking guy and Handsome. I know my my wife thought the same thing and her sister thought the same thing and and when I met your your daughter who came with you to the presentation uh, I don't I don't remember which one it was do you remember you know that's Corey that was Corey, was Corey. She still works for me yeah well she's very very pretty girl and I'm and I think yeah. I told her I said you know what I think Ark would have liked you <laughs> yes. oh he would have liked her yeah no and she would have liked him brother yeah yeah Loved I think him so. as well. And she, she was not only beautiful, but she had a great personality, or has, you know, she had when I met her, for sure. She does indeed. We're blessed to have her. I really appreciate that. I'll let her know you shared that. Yeah, say that she, uh, let her know and uh, tell Lisa hello. Lisa does, I know, a tremendous amount of work, and she's been great getting this arranged for me. And Cool. Uh, thank you for your time. You're a busy man, so I really appreciate you carving out some time for us. And... Um, Anything you want to say in closing? Anything you'd like the listeners to know? Or, or anything specific you'd like me to write up in the show notes for people to know about you? Oh, you know, I don't know. I mean, right now I'm looking at, uh, I think, PSC Sam Huff. She was private first class. She was at only 18. And she died with an IED in, in Iraq. That's who I'm working on. You can't really see her. Uh, but you can hear, you know, on her behalf through my voice. But... Um, so, uh, you know, 18 is very young. I lost my dad at 86 a couple of weeks ago. And, I, you know, it's people, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, you know what, that's a great run. If you can get 86 years out, you know, serve in the Korean War, raise a family, be successful, be the loving and kind man that he was and is and will always be. Um, for us, I stared at these kids. I've stared in the eyes of their grieving families. And for me, when he passed, I was like thankful. He'd been struggling for a while. Uh, there's, there's no burden there. So if you can't take stock in the fact that no matter how old you are, or whatever you're going through, that there are people giving their life that last week he was 21. Sam Huff, this girl, 18. Um, so <clears throat> that void, that age chronologically, we should put in perspective and compare it to some of our own problems, some of our own grief with the loss of a parent or someone or a loved one somewhere in your life and measure that to the people that said, I will and I'll go there. And it, they paid the ultimate price for that. And so that perspective is the only thing that I, I hope, I wish... And if I can, leave that kind of footprint in the mud for more Americans to think about. Um, and they can, you know, think about the Star Spangled Banner when it's being sung at the championship games and things like that. A little bit more fervently, a little bit more patriotically, and a little bit more appreciatively than I've done my work well. Yeah, it's, it's easy to do from your example. So thank you, sir. You got it, brother. Thank you for having me.